So yeah, I guess unlike uh, a lot of the previous uh, speakers, I am part of the Redwood Center, but I'm a current member, I guess. So I'm a second year graduate student at uh, UC Berkeley at the Redwood Center. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about work I've done with uh, my uh, lab mate, uh, Jesse Livesey, who's in the audience, and uh, Arjun Bonsall, who's at uh, Nirvana Systems, and also, uh, obviously, my advisor, Bruno Olshausen. So, my talk's gonna be a little bit different from, I guess, the standard deep learning architectures that people are familiar with, which is, you know, supervised learning. So, the thing about supervised learning is that it tries to collapse variation. Like, with supervised learning, you try to sort of be invariant to things that you don't care about, which is things that are like, you know, translation, rotation, and pose. And you try to remove that so that your model can predict, you know, the classification class better. And we do that in multiple ways. Like, for example, ComNets, we use pooling. We manually put in this invariance mechanism that sort of prevents the network from, you know, being uh, sensitive to translation. But also we do other things like data augmentation, which is basically adding more examples in your data that have these translations and these rotations that we don't want to sort of be affected by in the, neural, in the neural network. So we teach it to be invariant to these sort of things. But then you look at unsupervised learning, which is sort of the other way, the other sort of side of the uh, equation, which is basically they try to preserve variation in the data. What they try to do is they try to learn all the variations that are relevant to the data and preserve those in some sort of latent representation. But what's interesting is that like these latent representations are sort of entangled with you know, class and other information that sort of reconstructs or you know, generates the data well. So, you sort of have these two opposites that sort of live in sort of different ends of the uh, spectrum of whether you want to collapse variability or you want to preserve it to generate data. And uh, our approach that I'm going to describe is basically you want to use class information as another set of latent representation for your model. So uh, what I'm describing is very simple, basically. It's a standard autoencoder in terms of the way you feed forward. You have an encoder and a decoder. And the idea is that basically you have a set of uh, Y variables in your encoder that create basically a supervised network, and these can be you know, your class labels. But then also, you augment this uh, encoder with these Z variables, which are unlabeled variables. These unlabeled variables are basically the other variations in your data that aren't related to class. And what's interesting is that you can get these variables trained by simply having an autoencoder require you to reconstruct the digit well, in this case, for example, the digit zero. So the idea is that given this autoencoder generative framework, you can learn other variations that aren't necessarily related to class. And you want to wonder, and you wonder, you know, what those variations are. Like, so the title of my talk, you know, is sort of called Exploring Deep Space. And I imagine that these Y and Z variables are basically deep space. They're sort of the idea that you have this abstract rep representation in these higher levels of these deep neural networks that you sort of want to find out what they're doing and sort of what they're encoding. So to do this, to do this, I sort of demonstrate this sort of on three different data sets. Uh, the MNIST data set, which I think most people are familiar with. You know, it's the standard toy data set for deep learning now. I mean, it's very, you know, low dimensional compared to most things and also fairly high number of samples. And there's also another data set that uh, if, you know, people weren't used to faces already, another data set called CMU Multipy, which is just uh, a data set of faces and people with, you know, different camera poses. So the ca there's 13 different cameras and there's also 19 different illumination conditions. So the idea is that like, you have labels for the camera poses at each position, and you also have the different illumination condition for each, each person. And also, finally, a Toronto Faces data set, which is actually a data set that I think uh, Joshua Suskind uh, collected from uh, Toronto. And this data set has uh, seven different emotions for different identities of people. So basically, the idea is that you have seven different labels for each person's emotion, being happy, sad, excited, uh, surprised, fearful, and neutral, and things like that. So, the idea is that if you have these latent variables, and for example, if you do it for MNIST, and you only have two latent variables, you can visualize them pretty easily. You can just do a scatter plot of these sort of latent variables. And what's interesting is that when you train the network, as I just showed you before, these latent variables basically encode two different uh, sort of uh, basically variations in the data. And basically, the, the distribution on the test set is basically Gaussian, which is actually kind of nice. Because if they're Gaussian, you can sort of move around them pretty smoothly. And what happens is that when you uh, sort of move around this uh, latent space and you generate each class back, they become the style of the digit. And this kind of makes sense because for an autoencoder, if you're just given class information, like if I told you to draw the number five and I only told you it was number five, you couldn't reconstruct the digit very well because you don't, need, you don't have other details like you know, the orientation of the five, the position, the, the, the uh, slant, and all these other style variables. So it's interesting that the Z variables now become the style variables that were missing in the class information. And what's interesting is that you can move around this space pretty smoothly. So in those two sort of animations I'm showing right now is you fix one Z variable and you just shift back and forth 
between one, the other Z variable. And you can see that each one of these Z variables sort of encodes different aspects of the uh, image, which is, you know, the style. For example, the Z2 encodes sort of the slant of the digit, and Z1 encodes sort of the uh, width of the digit. So it's pretty interesting that, like, this nice space of different sort of aspects besides class, you can sort of get out of these deep networks just by making it an autoencoder and just adding these Z variables. So this is not very different from, you know, standard three-port architecture, but you can get pretty high-level representations that aren't related to class in these networks. So we did this also on MultiPy, obviously, and what you can do now is you can also control the observe variables. So before I was showing you that you were controlling the Z variables and moving around in Z space and seeing what the model generated. Now you can also generate uh, basically rotations of a person's face. So what you can do is you can fix the Z variables, which in, for faces actually becomes the identity of the person, and you can move around the observe latent variables and iterate through them and see that it basically given one image of a face in a test set, you can sort of rotate that face. So this is just showing for, you know, the left column is basically the original test set images, and then the, uh, the uh, right of it is basically the rotations that I generate from that image with the standard autoencoder framework. So since we also have the lighting variables for this particular CMU multiply data set, you can also generate different lighting conditions for the same face. So the idea is that you can also reorient the face in a certain direction for a specific camera pose, and then you can also change the lighting variables given that face. So this is just showing the same thing with you know, the lighting variables. So another interesting thing is that I think people have shown in the, in the previous talk is that given a face in the test set, you can also control its emotion with the emotion data set, where every time you change the class variable, you change the person's emotion from the original emotion that they were displaying. So this is just showing that example. But what's interesting is that they're not discrete uh, things. Like, although you have 13 discrete camera poses, you can smoothly interpolate this space and generate basically a smooth transition between each camera as if the camera was actually in all these positions at once. So in the top row, you can show that I'm interpolating between the 13 different camera positions. In the bottom row, I'm just doing a, a smooth interpolation between each of those uh, supervised variables, smoothly interpolating. So you can see that it actually turns a very smooth sort of uh, image in terms of the fact that when you go between one camera position to the other camera position, you don't get a drop off in quality. It's a very smooth transition. So it's interesting that the model is able to interpolate these sort of uh, aspects because there was never a camera position there but you could also imagine the fact that the network sort of impl implicitly knows that between one camera position and another camera position, you can generate a reasonable image for that sort of between those two cameras. So you can also do this for lighting. Uh, the top row again is the uh, 13 different lighting, uh, uh, lighting variables discreetly sort of stepped through. And the bottom is sort of the smooth interpolation of them. And you can see that it also works for the lighting. Now, beyond interpolation, we've, I found, we found that these networks also sort of do extrapolation. So what's interesting is that at the Y layer I showed you before, the network had a softmax layer. And what's interesting is that that softmax layer basically went from zero to one. And, but when you feed the decoder, you can feed the decoder any value you want, even though it only saw values between zero and one. But you would imagine that if you fed it, you know, for example, five, it would sort of you know, blow up and nothing useful would happen because it never saw an example of five. What you can see is that when you go from zero to five for each of those class emotions, you actually emphasize the emotion even more and the fact that it actually generates a reasonable image. And then we try something even more interesting, which is generating the negative of the emotion, which is a value that it never, it never even saw the same sign of this value before, since, since it only saw values between zero and one. And you see that the negative emotion space is still also pretty plausible in the sense that like, if you look at the happy face, the negative five emotion is basically like a sad or a pouty face, which is kind of interesting. And then you look at the uh, disgust face, and then you look at the opposite of that, just a, you know, just like almost like a okay face, sort of like a reasonable face. But then what's interesting is that like, if you look at the uh, plus, plus five to the minus five, where the eyes are very open in the plus five, the eyes are very closed in the minus five, and vice versa for when the eyes are very closed in the plus five, plus five, or the eyes are very open in the plus five, the eyes are very closed in the minus five. So what's interesting is that it learned a reasonable way to sort of orient these sort of uh, high level features of the face so, so basically map them to values that's never even seen before in the training set or the test set. And basically this is what I would call extrapolation in the sense that we're feeding it values that it's never seen before, not even, even close to the range, and it's still doing something reasonable. And then you can see in the top row is basically it's smoothly sort of going between negative five and positive five. So what we learned is that these sort of uh, latent representations that this model learns is basically 
pretty, pretty reasonable in the sense that it can learn high-level extractions that generalize pretty well beyond the space it's ever seen before. And, we can ch and the thing is, like, we, you should choose not to throw away these sort of variations. Because the issue, the issue is that when you do just classification, you're throwing away all these variations. You're sort of forgetting that, oh, well, you know, dogs can be you know, oriented in multiple positions. You know, uh, uh, digits can be sort of different, uh, could be you know, sort of different slants and different styles. And you sort of want to preserve these variations to sort of learn these high-level representations. Because it's more information for the model to sort of preserve it. And also, we, I've just shown that you know, deep layers can extrapolate well beyond much of the uh, data that's ever seen before. And this is sort of surprising because you would imagine that, you know, given like the previous talks, like these networks, what people would argue, are just, you know, interpolating or memorizing these examples or potentially just, you know, not generalizing well to data that's never seen before, for example, the adversarial examples. So uh, those are my results, and uh, this is a link to the paper that's currently in, under review uh, if you want to read more about this, and uh, thank you.